very valuable. His friendship, his guidance, his wisdom to be. I was in the France when I first heard the fog was grave real. And so the last conversation we had was on the phone. His voice was weak, but the spirit behind the voice, gently stoical, full of dry wood, was the same as ever. We agreed that as soon as I was back in England, we'd have one of our regular lunches. I think we both knew that it would never happen. And this would have been a very difficult moment for me. If I hadn't already said months before in the Italian in Stanmore, which of course you all know so well, what I would have otherwise wanted to say at that moment. What I'd said over the Veal Lamoni and the Monte Pulciano was simply this Bob, you were my master's degree in screenwriting. I first worked with Bob on the Return of the Saints series. Obviously, he wouldn't never have hired me if I hadn't already acquired a service given the dark art. But under Bob's gentle but very firm tutelage, I soon realised that I was a comparative novice. It was Bob who taught me that when a scene isn't working, the problem is not a surface one, but a structural one. You have to track back through the whole structure of the story, find the fundamental flaw and correct it. For example, I came up with a story where the St. Woods is a murder in a remote Italian village. I wrote the script on the basis that the locals are trying to keep the saint in, trap him inside the village. It didn't work. Scene after scene fell flat. It was baffling. Till Bob suddenly said, let's try turning it upside down. It was a favourite phrase of his, born of his immense experience, and one that has been a guiding light for me ever since. We turned it upside down. Instead of keeping the saint in, the village just tried to force him out, and suddenly it all worked. The scenes took on a whole new life, the story became compelling. But as we know, a script can be structurally sound. At the same time, some of the scenes can be rather dull, cliché, and predictable. Enter another infallible Bob Baker principle. Do it the other way round. The saint needs an old friend, the old friend gives him the information he needs. Boring. <coughs> Do it the other way round. The saint needs an old enemy. They hate each other. The saint still gets the information he needs. It's more difficult, but it's much more interesting for the audience. And the audience, of course, was always Bob's first concern. Bob Baker principle number three. Logical surprise. Get a character into an apparently impossible situation. Work out how you could get out of it. Don't reveal it. Don't show it. Cut. He's out. The audience is surprised, intrigued. How did he do it? Drop the information in. The audience is satisfied and delighted. I could go on and on. As Gareth said, Bob loved this process. He loved this part of the business, working on the screenplays. Perhaps the best thing I ever did professionally, and Bob used to say it was probably the most enjoyable thing he ever did, was the 13-hour Caribbean swashbuckler return to Treasure Island. My wife and I were moving house for me when I wrote the bulk of it, so I worked in an office in the old Elm Street studios. I love those happy days. Bob and I met every day to plot out the next moves in a complex saga that took the audience from the Admiral Benbow Inn to Treasure Island via Jamaica and Mexico. The overwhelming character in this piece is, of course, Long John Silver. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that in devising the story, Bob actually became Long John Silver. He didn't need the power to the peg leg, he already had the pipe. He entered the, into the very soul of this completely self serving and somehow lovable rogue. Bob's capacity to devise twists and turns for Long John was absolutely inexhaustible. But much more important was his ability to retain the sympathy of the audience for a character whose behaviour was so utterly deplorable in almost every respect. Our collaboration didn't end with the scripts. Very generously, Bob kept me abreast of every move in the convoluted business of getting the series financed and made. Believe me. The twists and turns in that adventure made the show itself look positively linear. It was a close-up view of Bob the producer. I was privileged to experience firsthand his quiet determination, his realism, his people skills, his generosity, and above all, his complete honesty. He 
He knew exactly when to press forward and when to draw back, when to insist, when to concede. He was a master, and he got the show done. In many ways, this is a strange business we're in. Relationships are almost always intense, but too often ephemeral. The kaleidoscope shifts, we move on. It's rare indeed for a genuine and lasting friendship to emerge. Bob and I remained friends long after our professional relationship ceased. This was not because I felt I owed him so much, that God knows I do. It was because I loved and respected him so much. He ceased to be the awe-inspiring producer and became a cherished companion. It has been an honour tinged with great sadness to add my voice to this tribute to Bob. His professional achievements are a matter of history. His personal grace and charm are known to everybody here. What matters most is that he was a great and humane man whose civilised values underpinned everything he did in his long and fruitful life. And it's chiefly for this, I think, that we give thanks today. It is this that we celebrate. Yeah.